Good morning, triple students. So today we're going to look at, um, this is a, a new topic. This is a triple only topic about evolution and the history of genetics and different theories of evolution. So we're going to start here today just looking about sort of what you might already know, but we're going to look at Charles Darwin, his theory of evolution. We're going to look at some other people and their theories of evolution. And we're going to take some time to um, look at all the different theories how many tick boxes, compare them, what's similar, what's different, why is it that Darwin's theory of evolution has stood the test of time? Remember, a theory is just a theory. It's, it's um, so when theories are brought about in science, it's due to ideas that are peer reviewed and generally accepted over time as being the best fit that we have. So the Big Bang theory is the best fit theory for how the universe began, um, according to the evidence we have. So we're going to look through evolution, we're going to look at the misconceptions and the main ideas behind Charles Darwin's work. And then from this, we're going to build around and look at genetics. We're going to take into account the, we looked at the different types of reproduction on the last one. So obviously sexual reproduction produces variation, which leads to evolution. So there's a lot of linking to be done here. So let's get cracking. Okay, so you're going to be looking at Charles Darwin, the ideas that he came up with, what natural selection means, what origin of species is and evolution. You might want to stop it here and just write down what you know already, because this is a really good way of getting misconceptions out. Because if you don't challenge your ideas, you don't have any growth of ideas. So, for example, the most common misconception with Darwin is that we come from monkeys. That's the most common misconception that I hear from students. It's like, oh, this is the thing where we're like, come from monkeys. No. OK, so if that's a misconception that you have, write it down. Um, so maybe pause it. Hopefully you've unpaused it now and um, we will... Um, I'll talk to you about the ancestry and how we are related to primates. Um, so let's go. OK, so these are the three main things from today's lesson. So stating um, that Darwin came up with the theory of evolution that we accept today. I think everyone can do that. That would be your, like your grade threes, your grade fours. Um, describe the evidence. Now, this is going to get you your grade fours, grade fives. If you can describe evidence and things that support Darwin's theory, if you can explain why his theory wasn't accepted, you can also talk about other theories um, and the differences and similarities. That's when you're getting to your grade sevens, eights, nines. If you're able to evaluate and justify why Darwin's theory was the is the best fit, then that's going to get you to the top grades. Everyone can achieve this. Very achievable in the sphere of evolution, as long as you've got that evidence to back up and justify what you're saying. So I've got this kind of beautiful, um, iconic picture, really. Um, of Darwin's work. So Darwin um, got a lot of evidence for his theory of evolution by um, going to the Galapagos Islands and all the Galapagos Islands had had finches. They had common common type of birds. Now you can see all of these are finches but they all look different. So we've got a large ground finch, cactus finch, tree finch and small ground finch. <laughs> My cat's called Finch and has just wandered into the room looking at me very confused. Um, now, what I want you to notice, and this is what he noticed, was the shape of their beaks. They've all got different shaped beaks. So the top one has got a very large, strong beak. The second one has got a very pointy beak. The, uh, the tree finch has got a very, very small pointy beak. And then um, the other one has a slightly stronger but more rounded beak. And he noticed in these birds that there was all these different variations and he noticed that there were variations in the islands they were living on so for example one of them was very abundant in nuts so i would suggest the top one to number one is going to have a strong enough beak to break into nuts whereas um let's say the fourth one came from a galapagos island where there were a lot of worms and so he noticed that these finches had adapted to the environment that they were living in and then he thought well they wouldn't have done that straight away and so he started considering lineage and this is where he got most of the evidence for for his theory of evolution um this is a wonderful picture so this shows um, the theory of evolution that we've come is quite a cynical cartoon. Um, so we've got fish coming out of the sea and, and, and evolving to grow legs. Um, and then we have got primates evolving into man. And then we've got man polluting the world that they've been involved into. Um, there's a lot of these funny kind of evolutionary things. But when I was talking about ancestry, how we're related to primates, we're also related to millions of other species because we all have a common ancestor. 
Um, here's another one as well. So we've got the evolution from primates up to standing man, up to um, Facebook profile, John Smith, which is brilliant. Um, So the book about evolution that um, Darwin came up with was called The Origin of Species. Um, and The Origin of Species made ripples and waves throughout the scientific and the community as a whole um, and was a huge monument of work. So we're going to look at what that work was. Um, so this is a brief history of three billion years ago to today. So we've got the Big Bang at the back there and we've got Vol volcanoes and so this would be um, evolving the evolution of the earth's atmosphere and then we've got viruses and single-celled organisms and then we've got moving organisms we've got dinosaurs we've got horses and then we've got man right at the bottom um, and this is just again another beautiful visual representation of how different species evolved at different times man just didn't get plonked on the earth and this is problems that darwin came up with because he had a lot of opposition from the churches for one um, so this is him, this is the man, the legend, Charles Darwin, um, and he came up with the theory of natural selection and he wrote about it in The Origin of Species. Uh, note the time, so he was around 1809 to 1882, so I can strongly suggest he definitely wasn't Jack the Ripper, um, but he lived through the times of the Industrial Revolution, um, very, very religious um, portion of history as well. Um, it took 50 years for his theory to become accepted. His ideas went against that God created the world. So obviously, if we are thinking about in terms of Christianity, they believe that um, God made the world in seven days and he made image of man. Um, and then he made image of woman from man's rib. Um, he was ridiculed by the press. And you can see here um, this picture of him with an ape's body. Um, and... It was a really huge decision for him to decide to release his work because it was so damning against um, church beliefs and things like that. But he was hurried into releasing it due to another um, another scientist that we'll talk about in a different video. Um, he was sort of hurried into releasing it because um, he was in danger of having um, his life work not seen um, and someone else taking credit for such a brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of work. Um, so, again, there's another picture saying R.R ancestors the apes well there is we share a lot of dna um with apes and we know that now darwin didn't know anything about dna or anything like that um i mean all we knew about genetics by this point was um the work of a monk called gregor mendel that said that there are two genes that are responsible for your characteristics and so um and and even then he wouldn't have been uh wouldn't have known any of this so this is purely observation but um he, he came up with the idea that we are all formed from the tree of life and so we will branch off, but we all come from a common ancestor. And it just happens that we have branched off later from, from apes. So they are a common ancestor, but we didn't come from monkeys. Um, <laughs> brilliant picture. Uh, but you can see a lot of variation and a lot of um, uh, differences and similarities between all of these species. So we've got um, uh, man, we've got orangutans, we have got gorillas. We have got uh, chimpanzees and they all have certain features in common. Um, and um, and that's, that's obvious. We actually have the same number of hair follicles, for example, as, a, as an ape. Um, it's just the hairs aren't as thick or you can't see them or there, are, you know, there aren't hairs necessarily coming out of all of them. But we do actually have the same amount of hair follicles as an ape, which is interesting. Um, so this is um, Homo erectus, which is our closest. So we we are Homo sapien, which means wise man. Um, and Homo erectus means erect man. So Homo means man. Um, so this is um, um, this is where we differ from um, from primates, because primates don't have the pelvis that allows them to walk up straight. So we we know that Homo erectus is probably the link between modern man and primates. That's where we would have separated along our evolutionary journey. Um, so evidence for evolution that we all come from this common ancestor over time can be seen from the fossil record. So the fossil record is literally, as it sounds, is a record of fossils and preserved bones and remains 
um, that are formed over uh, millions of years when it comes to fossils. We'll talk about fossils, but we've got clear evidence here that we have got similarities and changes that happen throughout the structure when we get up to modern man on the left. Um, so we can see evidence in bones and fossils that um, that um, we have all come from a common ancestor. Um, there's another picture here of um, of different primates. So we've got gibbons, orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and then man. You can see that there's a lot of similarities. This is actually from um, uh, this is from the Museum of Royal College of Surgeons. Um, um, and again, just shows a lot of similarities, but also the differences between uh, between primates and humans, showing that they probably did evolve from a common ancestor. And then evolution of a human skull as well. So how the skull has changed over time. All really good evidence for his theory of evolution that we come from a common ancestor and changes occur. I realise I haven't really gone into the theory. That comes up on a different slide so that you can put um, some notes if you weren't sure what to write so, so far. So notice how the skull um, has changed um, in this time. Even now, we can see evolution um, in humans, particularly in terms of skull size. I don't know if you've ever been in the opportunity to try on a hat from the 1920s. The chances are it won't fit your head. Heads were smaller, feet were smaller. We've seen evolution in the last hundred years in terms of man, um, right the way from um, the beginning of the 20th century um, to now. Things like the traditional sizings for the cockpits of Spitfires, much, much smaller um, and shorter capacity because people are getting taller. And you might even see that in your own family where you have uh, quite short parents and quite tall children. Um, I certainly have that in my family. We have not not short, short, but we've got um, both of my parents are quite short and both of my siblings are incredibly tall. Um, so we see this evolution happening over time. But why do we evolve is also the question we need to ask. More capacity of skull and brain. So you can see here from gorilla up to modern human, skulls have evolved to, ha to be able to house larger brains. And of course, what differentiates man from certain animals is the ability to use their brain and process thought and emotions and feelings and communicate and things like that. So the brain needs to be big. Quite huge. Um, you also see a lot of natural uh, selective and evolutionary behaviours between primates and humans as well. So, for example, um, when animals are born, it is instinctual for them to want to feed, like in this picture. OK, so let's take you through Darwin's theory in a little bit. Well, not detail. It's kind of an overall summary. We're going to keep coming back to him so it should solidify it in your mind. So this is what evolution is. It's the slow, continual change of organisms over a very long period of time. All living things on Earth have developed from the first simple life forms that arrive three billion years ago. That's billion, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So that is what the evolution is. It's the slow, continual change of organisms over a long time and that all species on Earth have developed from this first simple life forms. Um, the species... Um, Evolution happens as um, species become better adapted to their environment. If these species don't adapt, they will become extinct and unable to deal with any of these factors. So what we know is thing, uh, things, species and organisms evolve and the ones that are better adapted will continue to evolve. The ones that are not adapted to their environment will become extinct. So they could become extinct due to competition, changes in the environment, new diseases being introduced or new predators. So I think there's a slide later on, um, but humans are huge predators and we are causing the extinction of many species. The white rhinos just become extinct and that is down to the predators of humans. So if you cannot adapt to these four factors, you will become extinct. Not you personally, I'm sure. So these are the key observations for his theory of evolution. So all living things produce more offspring than will survive into adulthood. So, for example, birds might give might give birth. They don't give birth. Will lay like eight eggs and only three of them will potentially survive. So all living things produce more offspring than will survive into adulthood. And we definitely see that um, in times such as, well, prior to um, there being contraception available. Families had a lot of children and most, not most of them, some, a lot of them would not make it to adulthood 
because the world was dangerous and toxic and misunderstood. Uh, population sizes will remain roughly constant. Now, we know that this isn't true in the terms of humans. Our population sizes are continuing to grow and that presents problems. Um, but we know this in interdependence. We've got species are interdependent. So if you think about foxes and rabbits, they peak and trough, peak and trough, but <coughs> roughly remain constant. Variation exists among species. And we know this now. He didn't know them. We know variation exists because of sexual reproduction and because of meiosis producing gametes that um, all contain different DNA and we get this blend of DNA. He didn't know any of this about DNA, but he knew that there were variation amongst species and some of those variations were more advantageous than others. Characteristics or that good variation was passed on from one generation to the next. And all of these things helped him conclude that species evolve a long, long period of time by a mechanism called natural selection. And the main evidence from this is the fossil records when we're looking at fossils. But natural selection, you've probably heard of the term survival of the fittest. And what that means is, in terms of natural selection, is that organisms that are born with a better adaptation to survive are more likely to reproduce and have offspring with those adaptations. Unlike organisms that are born that are not adapted and so therefore cannot survive. There's a really good example in um, Australia. There's this really gorgeous bird. I can't remember what it's called, um, but it's sort of a ground dwelling, very sweet bird. Um, when they introduced um, uh, sort of uh, pre predatory mammals to Australia, they all got eaten. All of them, because they'd never seen a predator before. They hadn't adapted to meeting predators. And so they all got eaten. Um, and you might you might get um, this variation and characteristics can be caused occasionally by mutation. So, for example, the first person born with a pelvis that was straight enough to stand up would have been probably a mutation. And then that person would have survived and reproduced and then would have had offspring that had these more upright pelvises. So natural selection is about organisms with a good adaptation passing on their genetics to the future. Let's quickly go into a little bit more natural selection. So each species shows variation. There's competition within each species for food, living space, water and mates. So for example, in terms of the finches, on one particular island, there would have had been finches of different varieties, so like shorter beaks, longer beaks, harder, harder beaks, etc. And there's competition within each species for food, living space and water and mates. There's a short giraffe, there's a tall giraffe. Um, the better adapted members of these species are more likely to survive, and this is called survival of the fittest. So, for example, in terms of that large bird, that large bird was probably able to say, oh, I don't need that food. I am adapted to eat these nuts, but you guys aren't. So therefore, that member is better adapted. Um, so this tall giraffe is going to be able to eat all the trees and he's going to be gutted and probably not pass on his... Uh, probably not pass on his genetics to the next generation. The survivors will pass on genes to their offspring and show this beneficial variation. Boobies. Okay, so there was this other guy called Lamarck. And Lamarck had a really interesting theory about giraffes. Um, and so he would be a really good one to compare and contrast. So he came up with a theory of evolution, but it had a quite a few glaring differences. So similarities wise, Lamarck said, yep, yeah, your characteristics that you have will be passed on to your offspring. However, his theory of evolution was much more short term. So Lamarck's theory was that if you had a short neck giraffe, Throughout its lifetime, it will continue to stretch its neck to reach for a higher tree and stretch and stretch and stretch. It will become progressively larger and all evolution would be driven by this inner need that it had to survive. So what it's saying is that little giraffe should have just kept trying and then it will be a, a long neck giraffe and then it will pass on that long necked gene to its uh, offspring. That's a huge difference, not evolution over a period of time, slightly longer giraffe. Um, long neck giraffe would mate and have babies with slightly longer necks, etc. Is is Darwin's, but he. But what Lamarck is saying is, no, no. In your lifetime, you will evolve to meet your need, and therefore you'll pass that on to your offspring. Now we know that this cannot be true. Um, if you think about, I don't know, women that bodybuild, they don't give birth to really, really muscularly strong babies, um, and people that get tattoos don't give birth to tattooed babies. So 
we don't tend to environmental changes in ourselves we don't tend to pass them on unless it's really interesting if you look into the subject of epigenetics so any of you that are really interested look up epigenetics because that is how we change our genes while we are uh while we are living and then can then pass forward certain traits but really we can say that this theory didn't hold weight because changes in our lifetime couldn't be seen that fast and the chances are that little giraffe never got that tool and he would have died um the horse obviously you know i'm biased towards horses but the horse shows the best amount of evolution um because we have a complete fossil record for the horse so if you look right down the bottom um we have um something that doesn't really look like a horse it's about the size of a chicken and um it's got small teeth it's got five feet five feet it hasn't got five feet it's got four feet 60 million years ago but it's got five fingers it's what we would call a pentadactyl five digits on each foot and as you can see if you go upwards when we get to the mesohippus the merichippus which is a great name the horse is changing over 30 million years to now evolve down to only three fingers um and we can see as it goes up to 10 million years ago, um, the pliohippus um, is a very, very fast animal. It's got a very muscular back hind for, um, what's the word, for acceleration. And it's generally looking more and more like an athlete. And then at the top, we have got uh, the modern horse, which is called the Equus caballus, um, and has only now got one digit. Um, it has got other digits and there is evolutionary evidence. So horses have chestnuts and ergots, which are sort of the remains of this evolutionary changing through their foot so they went from having five digits sort of almost like claws to having this large keratin hoof structure this is a huge huge bit of evidence for evolution showing this change over time and coming from a um, from a very different organism um, and we have a complete fossil record for the horse which means that over millions of years these fossils have been formed and provide evidence for evolution um, the pentadactyl limb also um, shows evidence because there is evidence that a lot of organisms did have those those five digits. So it's a very small picture, I'm afraid. Um, so there's a bat flying um, and you can see it in their wings that they would have had five digits originally. The whale, the dolphin all have fossil records showing um, that they had five digits. The pig, obviously monkeys, moles even. So all showing that we have this common ancestor that had five digits on each limb. Here is a picture of a fossil. I'm not sure I can tell what that is. I can't remember, it's in my notes and I can't see them. It's kind of cool though. It's got a long tail, whatever it is. Um, and here we've got a picture of this gorgeous dodo, which were mostly eaten. Um, they were unable to adapt to their environment. They were unable to adapt to predators. And so we caught them and we ate them um, and they became extinct um, because they were unable to survive the competition. They weren't fit enough for uh, to adapt quick enough. What theory did Charles Darwin first propose? So this would take like this would get you like a grade two or one in uh, these days grades what was his most famous book called so this would be like a four it's the origin of species well done what birds did he use as evidence for his theory that'll be finches okay again this is old grades but these are good things for you to go and um uh, just sort of write a little profile for Charles Darwin and then we can compare that against um, against other things. So the theory he came up with, the journey he went on, you might want to Google that. Um, so again, these are grade threes, grade fours, the name of the book he wrote, evidence for those ideas. And then for a grade seven, um, what other people thought of his ideas. And then for a grade eight and grade nine, we're going to do comparisons, but we can't do a comparison until we go into the work completely. But you might want to compare against Lamarck's work. So that is similarities and differences with Lamarck's work, or you can evaluate them. What's advantageous about Darwin versus Lamarck? What's disadvantageous? Which one is better? Justify it. And that takes you to your grade sevens, your grade eights, your grade nines, and shows you really understand it. Tell somebody else. That also means you've learned it.